All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Um, you know, this is the first thing, Casey, where we would have disagreed. I wanted lunch to be a light salad and a jog around the green outside City Hall, uh, not a glass of red wine. So I know there is no tradition in uh, Korea of having a siesta after lunch, and I don't want you to start now. Okay, so we're not having a... Now, my panel session, which, and we will take the next hour on this panel till 10 past 3, if that's okay, um, we're determined to keep you awake during the, uh, the next hour. So uh, we, we'll be watching. Anybody sort of starts to nod off, we'll be asking you questions. So, uh, so pay attention. Now, we, we're going to be dealing with a, a very important uh, topic this afternoon, um, green, green growth. And we've got uh, two great speakers. Let me uh, introduce them to you now on my immediate right. Uh, Jim Elliott. Uh, Jim's from Samsung Electronics. He's the Vice President of the uh, Samsung Semiconductor, Inc. Um, Jim's uh, educated and lives in California, and he's a regular uh, keynote speaker at um, industry events uh, in the U.S. and indeed worldwide. So we're very lucky to have uh, Jim with us. And then my uh, other panelist is Kim Young-Jin, uh, also from part of the Samsung Group, Samsung SDS. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Kim uh, is an expert in strategic and process consulting. He's actually planned and managed um, various sustainability businesses, set them up and managed them. And he's got a background, which I think is very important, as a certified professional engineer uh, on factory management, so brings a particularly interesting uh, perspective to our discussions this afternoon. Now, I'm going to uh, get the proceedings going with a bit of background about growth, what does green growth mean, can we deal with growth and uh, climate change. And I have a, a few slides uh, to help me do that, which I hope I'm going to get up now. So just bear with us, I hope they'll be here. Well, you know, I could, I could, here we go, I could, uh, I was going to say I could have started talking without this particular visual aid, couldn't I? You know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the um, average growth rate in China for the last three decades has been 8% per annum. And although that might not be as impressive as the ICT growth here in Korea, for an economy, that is incredibly impressive. Um, if my maths are right, that translates into a 40-fold increase in economic output over those 30 years. And of course, a consequence of that is that millions of people in China now no longer live in, in poverty. Another consequence of that is now that China is the largest emitter of greenhouse gases on the planet. Now, when we, when we get into this uh, discussion about um, climate change and carbon emissions and so on, I think it's worth just having in mind what the economists and scientists think of as the, the five steps that link our activity with uh, climate change. And, and it's just worth taking you through what those, you know, what the five steps are. So it's people's activity, um, econ economic activity. That leads to the production of greenhouse gases, mostly carbon dioxide, but not exclusively. Um, that leads to a buildup of those greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, what are referred to as the stocks of greenhouse gases, which in turn leads to climate change, typically uh, temperature rising, which in turn has an impact on our world and on our life. Now, there are many uncertainties uh, in that chain, those five steps between people's activities um, and, the, and the impact on our lives. And as you know, a number of people are what you might call deniers of that. They don't, they don't believe that that link exists. But it's interesting, this is not a new science. You know, the first uh, scientific analysis of possible climate change occurred almost 200 years ago. It was a, typically a Frenchman, a French mathematician, a guy called Joseph uh, Fourier, who first did the, um, he first wondered why the world wasn't as warm as he calculated it should have been. And he then uh, postulated it was because of the build-up of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So almost uh, 200 years ago. 
So what I, thinking about that chain of those five things linking together, what I wanted to explore um, in this panel in the next hour is um, can we really grow and tackle climate change at the same time? And of course, to make it relevant to us as an audience, I want to look at the implications and the role of ICT in that debate. So can we grow, can we tackle climate change, and what role do we have in an industry uh, in that debate? Um, this is, I just like this slide. I mean, we, you know, if we, don't, if we don't pay attention, we just keep on growing. Is this the result? Whoa, what was that? That was the earth. Um, so are we, are we doomed just to uh, roll over uh, our planet uh, as, we, uh, as we motor on by? Um, let's hope not, eh? So uh, why am I sort of, why am I qualified to uh, talk to you about this? I'm just going to... I've got lost. Yeah, why, why am I qualified to talk to you about uh, this subject? Well, personally, I, I'm not really, but in the role of uh, leading our association's work in this, um, we, do, we have done some work. So we have got some, as an association, we do have some pedigree. I mean, if you think about, as I said to you, the first scientific analysis being 200 years ago, we as an association, and in fact, frankly, we as an industry, uh, what we would call in the UK, Johnny come late please, I think that will translate for you. We're very late at this party. We're really only in the last few years that has our industry um, has engaged in this. I, I spoke on this topic, I think two and a half years ago, at our WITSA uh, Global Public Policy Summit in Cairo. And the minister was introducing the agenda and he said, well today we're going to talk about internet governance and we're going to talk about uh, broadband, we're going to talk about spectrum. Oh, and we also have this novel topic of climate change on the agenda. We've never talked about that before. And that was only uh, two and a half years ago when um, it really became very visible on the, um, on the sort of IT policy agenda. Um, for us, how did it start? It started because people started to talk about the impact that our industry was having on the climate. They talked about the... Um, incredible energy consumption of these big flat screen televisions that were appearing on the scene. Um, and we talked to other industries um, who had perhaps been receiving criticism for the contribution that they were making to uh, climate change, particularly the airline industry. And their advice to us was, well, in the airline industry, we thought we'd just put our heads down for a bit and it would go away. And that turned out not to be the case. So we advise you as the tech industry to get on the front foot on this subject and get involved. And so early in 2008, which is not very long ago, we produced this report, uh, High Tech, Low Carbon. And it deals with two things. It deals with um, what our industry is doing to reduce its own carbon footprint and its impact on the environment. And it's a good story to tell. And I think you will hear some things from our other speakers this afternoon about that story. I think we're doing a good job. And, and there's more that we could do, but we're doing a good job as an industry. But we also moved on in this report to look at what does our industry do to help other sectors of the economy reduce their carbon footprint. So what I'm going to cover in, you know, just in my few minutes is a bit of, a bit of background to the climate change uh, debate, um, what I think the actions are that are needed um, a comment, a particular comment on our progress, and some ideas for improvement. So you know where you are. I've got three slides, really, that are on, on the background. Now, this is an, an interesting um, uh, discovery I made uh, relatively recently. There's a professor of environmental studies at the University of Colorado called Professor Roger Pilka. And, uh, in fact, his father uh, was also an eminent uh, climate change scientist. So he's not, he's not a denier, uh, as I said to you earlier. He really does believe uh, that the, there is a human impact. You know, I talked about those five steps, that that human impact can be demonstrated. He really does uh, believe it. In fact, he thinks it's probably understated. But he also has invented what he calls the iron law of climate politics, and I think it we should understand this law. What he argues is that if policies of emissions reduction come up against policies of economic growth, the emissions reduction policies lose out every time and the economic growth policies win out. He says this is the iron law and unless we confront 
this iron law, we will go on believing that simply espousing targets for greenhouse gas reduction will be just that. They will be targets, but they won't be achieved. And I'm sure many of us, when we look at the progress that has been made, would think, well, that sort of stacks up. I, I can believe that. Let me give you, um, if I can, just what I think are three climate change basics, also by way of background. So, uh, Francisco, you mentioned earlier that markets fail. I agree with you. This is a classic example of a market that fails. And it's obvious why that should be, because those of us who are uh, producing the activity which in turn leads to greenhouse gas emissions, we're not paying the price for it. It might be future generations. Unfortunately, they're not here at the table to get involved in that debate. So it is a classic market failure, and it is where public policy is really needed. Now, another, I think, important uh, fact here is that many people are arguing for um, a, a target, a limit of 500 parts per million of carbon dioxide equivalent. So that's the whole greenhouse gas thing. Today, we're at uh, 430. Um, that's, it, it's worth getting into that debate a little bit because that is quite, you know, there's enough of an argument here. Is 500 uh, the right goal? But let me tell you, 500, the scientists predict that there's a 96% chance of only, only a two degree rise in average global temperatures and only a 3% chance of a five degree rise. So it's a very small possibility of a three, uh, sorry, a very small possibility of a five degree rise in temperature. If you raise that target to say 650 parts per million, the chances of that five degree rise in temperature go up to 25%. Now, is that a risk we really want to take? Um, I'm not sure. Um, we definitely need to, to my third point, we need to focus, yes, of course, on the costs of taking action because the there will be a cost, there will be a cost to us as economies and society, but we also need to consider the risks, and, and there's been much discussion of the risks, but has there been much discussion of the benefits? Wouldn't we actually prefer a collaborative, cleaner, quieter, more biodiverse, safer world where fewer people live in poverty, which in turn provides a better market for our goods and services? Because there's a good argument that if we don't tackle this, then there isn't going to be. It's not just unbridled go. There will be serious competition for resources, and it will constrain our ability to be very parochial about it. It will constrain our ability uh, as an industry. So there's a, there's a need to balance costs, risk, and benefits of do something, do nothing. There's another um, bit of background, last bit of background, before we move on to uh, what needs to be done. It seems to be particularly inept with this today. Um, it, the, the thing to draw from uh, this, particular, this particular chart is that 63% um, of emissions, which is everything from the blue one for 27, go around the circle until you get to the next blue one, fugitive emissions. 63% are energy related. So two thirds of emissions are energy related. It sort of points us to where we ought to be focusing our attention and where we as an industry ought to be focusing our attention. Now, there's an excellent, excellent uh, uh, body of research which has culminated in a um, a document produced by an economist called Nicholas Stern. Nicholas was the chief economist uh, in Her Majesty's Treasury in the British government, uh, but he's also worked at the World Bank, and he now works at London School of Economics. And he, he led the Stern Review for the British government, and he's built on that work and produced something he calls a blueprint for a safer planet. And I really like this research because it sets out four, four areas. He, he describes the actions as falling into four areas, and I just want to look at these four areas and then go on and talk about, well, what's the role of ICC um, in these? So just let's take a, just explore what each of these four mean, first of all. So improving energy efficiency. Now that's particularly in, obviously, I've just talked about energy being a big area, so improving energy efficiency in 
energy production and distribution, but also in buildings and transport. We tackle those three areas, we make quite a big dent. Reversing deforestation, uh, I don't think many of us uh, realize that um, the two countries of Brazil and Indonesia alone, if we could reverse the deforestation, it would have a greater impact than dealing with road, sea, and air transportation. So uh, very important action. The third one is um, really bring technologies that are nearly there, bring, bring those to work, especially renewable, carbon capture and storage, and also the transport-related technologies. A lot of transport that aren't very far away need to be brought from pilot phase to uh, mass rollout. And then invest heavily in new technologies, so new solar photosynthesis, and again, especially the energy-related uh, investment. Now, it's interesting that the International Energy Agency has estimated that in any event, in any event, the investment that's needed in our energy infrastructure around the world is $1 trillion a year for the next 20 years. So why don't we focus some of that investment in, and of course we will, but that's what we've got to do, is focus some of that investment in these newer technologies that will reduce energy efficiency. So let's just look at um, how these, uh, how ICT plays into these various areas of um, uh, energy efficiency, reversing deforestation. Now, I put on here reversing deforestation, we don't have a lot to play in. Uh, of course, this, our industry likes to argue that we play in everything. Uh, and uh, so they would argue, well, no, we're monitoring deforestation at the very least. Um, but it, as you can see, I think we have a role as an industry to play in all four of these uh, all four of these actions. Is this what governments are worrying about, though? Is this how they see us? Um, OECD carried out a survey recently of uh, green ICT initiatives. And, of course, what they found is that there were 91 initiatives. And the majority of those were looking at IT's impact on the carbon footprint rather than the role of IT in these other areas. Completely missing the point. So, to my mind, one takeaway for others in industry is get the policymakers focused on what we can do for other people, not on reducing the carbon footprint of data centers. Albeit that is very important, it's not where the big wins are going to be made. So, what you're doing here, Jim, is very important, but there are other things you could be doing as well. So, let me uh, let me draw this to a uh, conclusion by uh, just giving you what I think needs to be done. Um, I think the only way we'll deal with this iron law of uh, you know, economic growth will always win out over, over climate change policies is to put the economy departments at the heart of the climate change policy making. For instance, there's a lot we could do with tax incentives to encourage the right sort of innovation. We need to encourage policymakers to see ICT as a solution and not, not a problem. We will get on with that stuff, as you will hear in a moment. But let's have us, let's have us be seen as part of the solution. And use networks like WITSA and its uh, GITT to develop and benchmark standards, discover and share solutions, and disseminate ideas. So look, what, what I've told you about here is uh, I've set out the, some of the background. Uh, I've laid out some actions that I think we should take and what the ICT involvement could be in that. Um, I've said that government focuses around the world focuses on us the wrong way, but we're not shirking our responsibilities, um, but they need to focus on us as part of the solution. And we need particularly the economy departments to be in control. And if we do those things, I think it isn't a choice. I think we can generate green growth, and I think that green growth will be good growth. So thank you very much.